Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker of today, Professor Michael Harris from University of Paris. Yes, you He will speak on Shimura varieties and research. Well, I have Shimura varieties and research for a Thank you. Ah, that's what the title was. Okay, so, 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 thank you very much. It's uh, thank, it's thank the organizers for inviting me back to uh, to Toronto. It's a pleasure to be here and speak in this uh, meeting in honor of the work of Ingo Bell Chow. Which I will try to say a little bit more in detail what about what he did, and this is going to be a uh, transition to this afternoon's talks. Uh, there are. Two parts, this was the, the original title, I forgot to update it. This, there are two parts of the title, and that there are two speakers, so naturally, since uh, Richard talked about Gawa representations, I'm going to be talking about Shimura varieties. So, so this is the word. So, um, the Langlands reciprocity conjectures to, to, uh, to Rizu. I'm also going to apologize, as, as Richard did, for directing my uh, talk. Uh, mainly for the people who who haven't shown up, but you know, but <laughs> Maybe, exactly. I was hoping you would be. Uh, you know, you could get get like a a posse, maybe organize a posse and find. <laughs> they thought there would be there wouldn't be any room. I can assure them there actually are many empty seats. And so there are two branches of mathematics that are linked to one another by the uh, Langlands reciprocity conjectures. And I'm going to describe them in a maybe peculiar way. So Galois representations, as Richard explains there, and the representations of the Galois group of, absolute Galois group of Q, actually its subgroups of finite index are just as relevant, the Galois groups of, of number fields, can be thought of as structures that organize the symmetries of roots of polynomials with coefficients in Q. And uh, unlike Richard, I'm going to avoid talking about the polynomials and only uh, talk about the structures that organize their symmetries. And on the other hand, the automorphic representations, which are usually much more difficult to describe, I, I, you can think of them as structures that organize solutions to certain families of differential equations on, on, um, on manifolds and also difference equations that, ha that have uh, that are characterized by their very high degree of symmetry. Uh, this, this is another way of talking about representations of Lie groups on the one hand, and that's the differential equations, and representations of piadic groups on the other. And the the theme of this conference is to unite these two structures by relating them both to geometry, which is is absent in principle. Uh, so the Gawa group is a profinite group, and it's, com it's compact for a totally disconnected topology. And Richard talked about continuous representations over algebraically closed fields or, or, or topological rings, uh, where the prime examples are either complex numbers or the piadic numbers, the algebraic closures of piadic numbers, but I will just talk about QP in practice. And in the latter case, assuming the coefficients are actually in QP, uh, for each uh, each integer, each positive integer, there's a, a representation on a finite ring, so that it has a finite image. And row X, uh, this X doesn't belong there. That's That was copied from another another page. Rho uh, is the unique representation whose represent reduction mod, mod p to the r is this rho r. That's what. So in other words, one can think of it either as a single object over the piadic numbers or as a whole collection of objects with compatibilities, which in some applications is more useful. So one way to motivate Galois representations for those who are, who are not motivated was to compare them to uh, to use this long-standing analogy between uh, Galois representations and homomorphisms of the fundamental group into complex uh, GLN of the complex numbers. Here, X is a compact Riemann surface with a, a base point. 
And the analogy is, off, is very fruitful in, in many ways. Uh, well, such tau can also be thought of as analytic objects, be, uh, uh, well, topological objects, rather, uh, because they parameterize local systems of uh, rank n over, over the Riemann surface. And uh, so local systems of, on curves are the geometric analog of uh, Gower representations. And there's some very recent work, I don't think it's been written down, that uh, might serve as a model for what one would like the Langland's reciprocity correspondence to be. This is a model where just to define uh, the terms on one side, not to mention both sides, would require several lectures of this length. But uh, on the one side, one has taken uh, the local systems. These are just n-dimensional local systems over, over the curve. And then constructed some sort of category of, of sheaves, but it's not really a category. It's something more complicated. On the other side, there is a stack related to the, the stacks that were discussed in, in Shodwar's talk yesterday of parameterizes bundles on the curve, just n, n bundles on the curve. And one looks at a category or the derived category or of uh, D modules on this. And the idea, the conjecture, this has not been proved in any generality, but it, at least a proof has been announced for n equals two, uh, is that there's an equivalence of categories that's natural with respect to a list of characterizations of both sides that would re require defining both sides in order to talk about the characterizations. So um, there it is again. So on the Galois side, that's the, uh, that's this side. Yes, I'm taking advantage of every <laughs> assistance. This is the Galois side. Uh, there's a category that in somehow, in some sense, realizes what you might call a space of rank n local systems in, a, in, a, in an abstract set, setting. And uh, on the other side, the automorphic side, uh, is a category of D modules which there are the differential equations. That's one reason to talk about this, because the differential equations are, are right there on some kind of space of n-dimensional vector bundles on, on X. Well, the precise definitions, as I said, are, are very technical. And uh, I sh shouldn't pretend, uh, I should, should not leave anybody with the impression that I actually am capable of making precise definitions. And the proof for n equals two, at least the, the, those parts of it that have been uh, sketched even more so. But the structure of the conjecture is clear. Uh, there's a categorical framework uh, on each side, and the construction of a Langlands transform, they call it a Langlands transform, which is a functor, uh, a precise procedure to get from one side to the other. And it goes in this, it goes in this direction, the Gawa side to the automorphic side. I, I should mention that, that in this setting, the Local systems are also, uh, can also, on a Riemann surface, can also be identified by, by the Riemann Hilbert correspondence with uh, differential equations with regular singularities. And so there are differential equations on both sides. And that's one, one uh, part of the analogy that fails uh, very drastically in the, uh, in the number, theory, number theory setting. So now, this question, why should more varieties? That's uh, well, having listened to, uh, to uh, Glenn Murray yesterday and his, his speech in favor of, of uh, research for its own sake. You know, I could just say, why not? But in fact, there's, uh, there are many, many other reasons to look at Shamur varieties. Maybe I'll list some of them. Uh, because they're, they're, they're kind of uh, central. They're, 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 they're at the confluence of many of the ma major strands of 20th century mathematics. And, and one, one of the, the virtues of, of Ingo Bauchal's work was to bring Shimor varieties into the 21st century, which is where they maybe they ju just drag them over the edge into the 21st century. Maybe they will remain there, or maybe, maybe not. Uh, but they're of, of great interest. They come up 
Right, surprisingly, many different branches of mathematics in, in algebraic topology and mathematical physics in, in uh, differential geometry, definitely ergodic theory, as well as in number theory in, in, in many different ways, representation theory of infinite dimensional Lie algebras. Um, but in this setting, they serve a purpose. They are, they, they are not studied so much for what they are as for what they can do. So here's the procedure that one would like. So let me maybe, maybe back up. So there's the, there's the equivalence of categories. And the procedure would be something somehow analogous to Fourier transform. There actually are plenty of Fourier transforms in Langland's program, but it's not nearly, nearly deep enough for the correspondence. It would be relating some sort of category over the space of Galois representations on the one hand, and some sort of category over the space of automorphic representations. Now, neither of these spaces is, is well defined. There, there are spaces of Galois representations to, to which Richard alluded indirectly at the end of his talk. There are spaces of automorphic representations much, much less well defined. Um, in the original setting of Langland, we are very far from such a procedure. And so we are at this state of improvisation. And what we are improvising with is what, whatever is available. And the most important available structures are Shimura varieties. When, when uh, Langlands uh, launched his program, within his program, there was a, uh, a concrete program to study the, the cohomology of Shimura varieties, the zeta functions of Shimura varieties. He, he uh, defined it. It was in his, his paper written, Some Contemporary Problems with Origins in the Jugendtraum. It was, uh, and he described it. I, I forgot to, to write down the exact quotation. But he described it as, essentially as a kind of exercise. And the exercise started in 1975. And it is uh, just basically being, being wrapped up. And one of this, this afternoon's, this afternoon's uh, talks will describe how far one has got to, to uh, carrying this out. And I should also say something, that not all Shimura varieties are equally popular. There are uh, Shimura varieties attached to different classes of groups. I'll list them maybe when I get to that point. And some of them do all the work, practically, and, and others have been practically, there are general theorems, but others are practically, have been in, practically entirely neglected. They have uh, added nothing that, uh, which I'm aware to understanding of the Gower representations, which is what Shimura varieties have been used for primarily. So uh, let me just introduce the most familiar Shimura variety, the modular curve. So um, SL2Z, uh, the unimodular group, acts on the upper half plane by linear fractional transformations. By a familiar formula. And the modular curve is the Riemann surface, uh, upper half plane modulo gamma of n. If you fix a level n, where gamma of n is the principal congruent subgroup uh, of level n, the two by two matrices congruent to the identity modulo n. And then the classical modular forms uh, are of level n, are the most familiar automorphic forms. Richard wrote down one. His Q expansion is the Q expansion of a modular form of level 11, actually slightly better than that. So they are solutions to differential equations when they're holomorphic functions. Uh, but more generally, one is looking uh, for solutions to essentially eigenfunctions of the hyperbolic Laplacian. And here they satisfy a, a symmetry. Well, this is the symmetry that they're on. They're on the, this space H modulo gamma of n, essentially. Uh, so this is the familiar formula. F of AZ plus B over CZ plus D is equal to F of Z multiplied by some, some, some multiplier for any element of the group. And there's also a, a, a growth condition I won't write down. Now, why I say solutions to difference equations, any time you have a quotient of the upper half plane by a, a discrete uh, a subgroup of SL2R, let's say a 
a portion of finite volume, you can look at solutions to the uh, hyperbolic Laplacian, eigenfunctions of the hyperbolic Laplacian, and these have a very interesting structure in general. Uh, been much studied, and at the same time, uh, a lot uh, is, remains unknown. If the quotient is by a group, uh, the congruence of group gamma of n, then there are also difference equations, which are usually called the uh, uh, Hecke operators, that relate the values it points to values it translates by rational elements. And this this is uh, the whole. Uh, this is this encapsulates the the symmetries involved in in automorphic representations. This is every, every, everything is is basically a generalization of this. More differential operators, more difference equations, but basically this sort of thing. And, and TP, there's one uh, Hecke operator, a P for each prime number. So one differential equation and one difference equation for each prime P. But as I said, this all gets absorbed in the representation theory below. Okay. So, so to return to the question, why should more varieties? What is it that they provide? Uh, well, they provide examples of vector spaces that are simultaneously representations of two objects. They are representations of the Galois group on the one hand, and they are automorphic representations in the sense, in the restricted sense I'll be talking about. So the two groups act simultaneously on the cohomology. The Gawa group for some finite extension, but for uh, purposes of exposition, one can always assume that it's the absolute Gawa group of Q. And a group that realizes at least the difference equation, the symmetries of the difference equations uh, I mentioned. Now, that's the, uh, the these, these actions commute, and so the cohomology can be interpreted as a kernel for what would be a very partial Langlands transform. In some sense, it's much more uh, con concrete and precise than, than the version, the categorical version I, I, I mentioned before. And under the solution, the restrictions that, that Richard mentioned, uh, these examples can be stretched. So there's, there you get some kind of partial transform and then by uh, additional manipulations you can stretch what you get from that and you can, and this is how you get the solution to the reciprocity problem, in, at least in the one direction that uh, Richard described. Well, this is all this let, instead of talking about Shimur varieties and how one gets these actions, let me talk about some simpler examples and more familiar examples. So let's look at the uh, complex plane minus a point. Well, we can it has like, two groups acting on it. One is just homotheties. And then you have GL2C, which acts by linear transformations. And these Actions commute, and we get an action on polynomials in uh, two variables. And the T action picks out different the eigenspaces for the for the action of, of T pick out spaces of homogeneous polynomials, and so you get an action like this for each integer, and you get an action of GL two. And this is just the usual representation of GL two on homogeneous polynomials of degree lambda. Well, this space C2 minus the origin is also the, the quotient of uh, GL2, SL2. Uh, no. Or uh, by the, uh, it's SL2. I changed my notation by the uh, by the uh, uh, maximal unipotent, and on uh, so G acts on the left and T acts on the right by this operator. So G should be SL2 there, but a G does still act. And if uh, more generally, if G is a reductive algebraic group over a field of characteristic zero, 
and n is a maximal unipotent subgroup, and t is a maximal torus normalizing n, then g mod cross t acts on the homogeneous space x, which is g mod n. Or equivalent, equivalently, uh, if you take the Borel subgroup, which is t times n, then g acts on the t vibration. Uh, so this is a, a principal homogeneous space over the flag variety, x with, with group t. And for any homomorphism uh, from t into c star, it acts on the line bundle. I, I, k was, it had better be c uh, in this case, which is defined by that, that uh, homomorphism. So you've got a line bundle over the flag variety. And so if lambda is positive relative to the choice of, of maximal unipotent subgroup, then the action on the space of, uh, of sections of this line bundle realizes the irreducible representation of G with highest weight lambda. This is the borel weight theorem up to a shift, which I won't write. And in this way, every irreducible representation of G is obtained in this case, coherent cohomology of flag varieties. And more generally, if you take any regular lambda, then there's a unique dimension in which uh, this has cohomology, the line bundle has cohomology, and this space realizes the irreducible representation with this uh, extreme weight, again, up to a, a, a shift that I wouldn't be able to write down correctly at this point. So this is the borel weil bot theorem. And it's, a, it's a, an illustration of the principle that if you have a space in which two groups act, then you can transfer you can get from parameterized representations of the second group by representations of the first. Here's a, another example that's maybe closer to the case of Shimura varieties. Let's look at G equals SL2FQ. It acts on FQ squared minus the origin, but in fact, it acts on the whole affine variety, uh, which is the affine two space and on the sub variety uh, defined by this single polynomial, the curve. And there's another group acting on this. Uh, K is now, say, so this is an affine variety, or, or also on the set of points, algebraic closure. There is a torus, the, 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 uh, that is a finite cyclic group in this case, of uh, Q plus first roots of unity in the quadratic extension of FQ. Um, and this acts also by homothetes, and this commutes with the action of G, and it fixes the variety. And so, in the same way, starting from a character of T, the special case of the linguistic theorem is this. Oh. Start with a character theta of T, and define this, like, can, for the sake, for the next minute, call it the linguistic transform, the uh, intertwiners from the character theta of t to the cohomology, compactly supported cohomology. In most cases, this is an irreducible rep cuspidal representation of g. So what is this cohomology? This is the aladic cohomology, but now we're looking at a variety over a finite field, so we, we, have to, we can't define it in, uh, in by elementary topology. It's the aladic etal cohomology with compact support. And this is the, for, the, the cohomology theory that one uses in studying varieties over finite fields, in particular, Shimura varieties, I get to them. And more generally, if you would take G, the FQ points of a reductive algebraic group, for example, the general linear group, then there's a collection, in general, collection of delian lustig varieties indexed by elements of the vial group, denoted W, and there's a finite abelian group, TW, and an action, commuting actions of G and TW, such that now we have better be careful that we, let's not specify a dimension. Let's consider the, the virtual representation, which is the alternating sum of cohomologies with uh, euler poincare characteristic of this variety. Then it decomposes as a direct sum you, you, I didn't write down the, the transform form, but you can look at the intertwiners for a given character that gives as a direct sum and 
every irreducible representation of G occurs in some in one of these. That's the mistake there. G is a finite. These are fine. These are group. This is the points over at the finite field. Now, unlike the the uh, the theorem on the SL GL two C, which we see by looking at it, this theorem is proved by applying the Lefschetz fixed point formula. So, just to remind you, a an irreducible representation over a field of characteristic zero, finite dimension. A finite dimensional, say a finite group, any finite group, is determined by its trace. Representation of the char just the, the character, which is the trace of uh, the elements. And the trace of the action of G cross TW is calculated by the Grotendieck Lefschetz formula, or of any, any action, provided the, the fixed points are isolated. It's the sum of, there's the, there's the, there's, this is the, the action on this alternating sum, and this is the sum of local terms. It's, oh, and these are numbers in QL bar, although one often can show that they are in some number field. And if it, the fixed points are not isolated, there's also a formula. It's more complicated. And in this way, cohomology is a useful kernel for a representation theoretic transform because the Lefschetz formula actually calculates the traces. And this requires some, some setup, however. And all the results I described are proved by fixed point formulas. Like, uh, so the borel v bot theorem was not originally proved this way, but it can be proved by the atiyah bot fixed point formula, I believe. I'm not sure, but I believe that when they uh, stated their, the fixed point formula, this was one of the first applications they gave. In the automorphic situation, one needs two fixed point formulas, uh, one of them topological or algebraic, and the other one analytic uh, that can nevertheless be interpreted as an index theorem. It's, uh, so you use the, the grotendieck lefschetz formula on the one hand and the Arthur Selberg trace formula, at least. And this is where the fundamental lemma is indispensable. In, Making, uh, making this into a usable, in these formulas into something one, which one can actually calculate. So now let me talk about, let me talk about automorphic representations. Um, I, I, I discovered in giving talks about this that people want to see what, what, automorph what automorphic representations are, but once they've seen the beginning of the description, they realize that what they really wanted to see was something else. <laughs> and and it's a not sure I'm not sure that I can can provide that that something else but let but let's see so so z hat is the profinite uh, completion of z which uh, some the inverse limit of projective limit over all finite quotient rings the finite adels can be defined not necessarily most uh, insightfully but but at least most uh, least space just by tensoring z hat with q. And if you have any finite extension, finite number field, you can then tensor uh, the finite adels, and you get the finite adels of that other number field. And an automorphic representation of gln over the number field f can be described, not defined, but can be described as, on the one hand, a continuous vector space representation of just the general linear group over this complicated ring, plus a representation. So you've got that. You've got the, uh, also the, you can also tensor, instead of with AF, you can tensor just with the reals, and you get a representation of GLN. And this also would better be a continuous vector space representation. Let's make them irreducible in whatever category we're working on. And they have to satisfy a compatibility property. And that's the, the compatibility, well, that's the compatibility properties where all the, all the action is, of course. But because we're going to be talking about cohomology, one can dispense with the definitions. Because there's going to be an action of GLN of the finite Adels on cohomology of a space, 
and then the uh, the uh, there's an action of of uh, the real lead group that can be unraveled from that, but it's best just to leave it implicit. It's in the geometry. The diff so by analogy with the geometric examples, we want the kernel to be a space with four properties. There should have been one after the other, but I forgot to put in pauses. So first, we want a cohomology theory for which the Lefschetz formula is valid, so that one can begin to compute. We want commuting actions of uh, the two groups of interest, on the one hand, the Galois group, on the other hand, the, uh, the finite Adele group. And part of the, I mean, the reason this is a, this is a good, this, this is a good, there's a story behind this. If, if things worked so smoothly, there wouldn't be much of a story. But the fact is, this is not really possible for n bigger than two. And so, so it gets, uh, the story gets spread out. Uh, then we need a good parameterization of the fixed points. Because remember, the Lefschetz formula is only as useful as the understanding of the fixed points. And then finally, uh, the action of at least one of the groups should be large in, in the sense that the shape of the fixed points shows that all the representations one is looking for actually occur in the cohomology. So if you have a structure that provides all these, the, the, these, these uh, advantages, then you can construct a transform by the, just a, an analog of uh, the formula I wrote down for the Lustig theorem, and you will get something. Get something. You can do, write it down in it for a structure with missing some of these, 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 uh, these uh, properties, and then you also get something. Not quite enough. So, and now, well, uh, no surprise. Uh, oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes. Yeah, so, with the, 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 uh, at this point, uh, well, I should have. I sh there should have been a slide saying that uh, the Shimura varieties have precisely these these properties, and that's why they are the ones that are used uh, in constructing the Galois representations that the subject of Richard's talk, and that's why there's this, this uh, today's meet, uh, session of the conference. But let's go to a case where there, the results are somewhat better. So let's look instead of uh, at the Langlands correspondence over number fields, over, over function fields, over finite fields. So let's consider a smooth projective curve over a finite field. And F is now the uh, field of rational functions on the curve. And, well, we cannot define the Adels by the formula I wrote down before because that required tensoring with Q, but there's an analogous definition over this field, F. Uh, Drinfeld introduced a family of schemes. Well, I'm not sure exactly how much of this Drinfeld did himself and how much of it he, he left uh, undone. He, certainly for N equals 2, he, do, he introduced family of schemes whose cohomology admit commuting actions of, of the Gawa group and the GL2 or GLN of the Adels and Lafort for all N use the cohomology of these Drinfeld modular varieties. And again, I, somebody who was there maybe would be able to tell me to, to how far he was inspired by the, the case of Shimur varieties. I know he was inspired by Langland's article on in the Antwerp conference on cohomology of Shimura varieties. The, there's a functorial Langlands reciprocity correspondence where this is the Euler Poincare uh, characteristic of the cohomology defined in whatever way. And you get, uh, well, you start with representations of the Galois group. And uh, for technical reasons, they have to be there twice but that's of, of, of no concern to us. And then there's a coefficient, which is a representation of the adult group, which is practically always of infinite dimension. 
And the upshot is that you can apply the grothendieck lefschetz trace formula, and, and uh, you can determine the trace in whatever sense it makes. So, so let me let me just say very very briefly, GLNAF is not a finite group, nor is the Gawa group for that, that matter. So uh, you cannot describe representations by traces in the same way as in the example of the Dudin-Lustig theorem. Instead of looking and the action of elements of GLN on the cohomology is not something one can isolate, but instead one constructs uh, averages over open of, ele of actions of elements over open compact subgroups. This is so. In this case, this is uh, totally disconnected. So it has so one can uh, take neighborhoods of the identity that are open and compact, and one can translate elements by elements of the group and trick construct and calculate the traces of those of those uh, operators. These are the kinds of operators one uses for for uh, representation theory of Adele groups. And you can calculate the the trace by the grothendieck lefschetz formula. And the action is seen to be large because the trace calculation for the Adele factor can be compared to the trace of the action of uh, the Adele group on the space of automorphic forms. This is where one needs the Arthur Selberg trace formula as well. So two trace formulas, two index, index theorems. And uh, this is how one proves, how Laforme proved the, uh, the uh, Langlands correspondence for GLN of uh, function fields. Okay. And Shimur varieties provide an approximation to that, an imperfect approximation. So let me, I, a few slides back, I reminded you of the theory of classical modular forms. So let G be a semi-simple matrix group over Q, as, as Valsperger reminded us yesterday, GLN is a, is a, is a particularly good example. Uh, and uh, consider uh, a maximal compact subgroup, uh, whatever it is, of the real points. And we, there is a list of groups for which the quotient, so the quotient G mod K is always a, a, a symmetric space, a Riemannian symmetric space. And for a short list, this is a Hermitian symmetric domain. I'm, not, I'm going to indulge myself and I'm going to write down the list. So, I, so we have, so G equals UPQ, which is also semi-simple as in, in uh, Valsperger's definition. And then uh, K is UP cross UQ, then G SP and R, K is uh, 2N UN. Then uh, there's something they, they get. So these are the popular ones. I mean, it used to be this was this is the, the this is the, the the top of the charts, and it's been displaced somewhat by by this. Uh, so then there's this one that practically nobody ever ever looks at. This, this is somehow real, and this is it's, it's complex. This is somehow quaternionic. And I don't remember what K is. Uh, K is SO2N maybe? Let's see. Is it UN? See, it's so, un, it's so, so popular that nobody remembers. Uh, then then uh, continuing SO2N, which is, let's make, take a connected part, and then K equals SO2 cross S O N and well at the bottom of the list there are cases where G is a form of E six or E seven and uh, for the, the, the Shamur there, there have there, there's been very important work on using exceptional groups 
uh, particular uh, to Shahidi and his uh, collaborators. And, uh, but for Shemur varieties, these Shemur varieties are, are quite neglected. Okay, so these are the these are the the, the uh, irreducible ones. And, okay. So when you take a discrete subgroup of cofinite invariant volume in G of R, then H mod gamma is a complex analytic variety. Right? It's obvious. It's a locally uh, symmetric variety. But now, if you assume that uh, gamma is a congruent subgroup, oh, yeah, maybe I should just say, this is a complex analytic variety, and it has differential equations with a high degree of symmetry, just like quotients of the upper half plane. But if gamma is a congruent subgroup, uh, then in the first place, it carries families of difference equations, heck operators, as, as in the classical case. Moreover, uh, this analytic variety is, in fact, an algebraic variety. In fact, it has a canonical model over a specific number field, E of gamma. And for most classical groups, that is basically these, this list, not this one. Uh, the canonical model was constructed by Shimura. I, I believe that Mark Kisson will be uh, extending the list and including, including this one, but unless I'm very much mistaken, he will not have anything to say about this this afternoon. And this is what Shimura, Shimura if, you, uh, if you have, have not, if you are not in this field and you just happen to notice that Shimura published about 20 papers in the annals in the 1960s and early 70s, this is what he was, this is what he was writing about. And this is why, this is why, as he says, his name has, has been turned into an adjective. So, but one thing you, you know, when you have this, this uh, canonical model uh, for a fixed gamma and for nearly all prime numbers P, you get a canonical model over a finite field of, of characteristic P. Now this, again, this is at least in, in, in Shimura's setting, this is, it's not exactly totally straightforward, but it's, it's understandable in, in the, again, what, one of the things that Mark is going to be talking about is, uh, I believe, is, is how this is not, this is not so straightforward in the cases he, he, he left out, but yet still something can be done. And therefore, the grotendieck lefschetz formula can be applied to these varieties. To, because, well, you couldn't count fixed points of, of varieties of, of, of correspondences or actions of uh, complex analytic varieties, but maybe I did not say this anywhere in my notes. But the whole point is that if you, if you want to, to get a, an action, to calculate the action of the Galois group, specifically the Frobenius elements, to which uh, that were, played such a, an important role in, in Richard's talk, then you absolutely need to apply the groton dick formula to a variety over a finite field. Right. So this, and that was, that was when, I, when I listed the properties of, of uh, that one, uh, desirable properties for a, a Langlands transform, this is really a very important one. Well, let's go back to modular curves because uh, this is, we don't have enough, we don't have an action of an adult group yet. Uh, there's nothing special about n. If you fix n, you can look at two n's, and then you get a natural surjective map, which is just a change of level of forgetting part of the level from m of n prime to m of n. And m of n is the quotient of m of n prime by the quotient of the corresponding uh, discrete groups. And in this way, one gets an action not of uh, GL2, but of SL2, of the, the profinite completion of Z on the family of the M of N, so on the collection of the M of Ns. And this, this is a, an action that's compatible with the change of level map. And this make, it makes sense because there's, there's, an, oh, oh, there's a, now this is a compact 
profinite group, but any given level, it's fixed by an open subgroup. So just get this is just another way of packaging what I already wrote. Much less obvious is the fact that the SL2Z hat action extends in a natural way to a continuous action of SL2 of the finite adels on the whole family. And once you have an action on the finite adels, it acts on the direct limit of uh, the cohomology for a different level. But this is not uh, optimal for a number of reasons. And one prefers to work with a variant family. It's, it's, so SH of N uh, is, each, for each N, it's a union of copies of the M of Ns that I wrote down. And the advantage is that you get an action of the uh, GL2, or the adults of the GL, of, uh, GL2. And this is now an algebraic variety over Q. And so the Galois group acts. And it commutes with the GL2AF action. This is always, this is always part of the uh, of theory in Shimur varieties. And now the theorem, uh, part of it was, I guess, first proved by Eichler in the case mentioned by uh, Richard, and continued uh, Shimur, Dulin, Angs, and Carrio. We look now at the cohomology with compact support in H1. And it establishes a correspondence from the, those irreducible cuspidal representations of GL2 of the finite adels that don't give, that give you a non-zero answer to two-dimensional representations of the Galois group. This is not the complete picture. So this is this is the this is what you get with uh, here. You can substitute uh, the trivial coefficients by other local local, L-adic local systems that are equivariant, and one gets more general Galois representations. And it's now known in almost complete generality uh, that this, <laughs> well, this is a kind of twisted formulation, now, almost complete generality for most two-dimensional representations. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the, uh, the, the Fontaine-Maser conjecture for, for, for those who know, which is practically everybody in the audience, the Fontaine major conjecture for odd uh, two-dimensional representations, aletic representations, is known in almost complete generality. With the, there are some exceptions for rather obscure technical reasons. And this is one could call the Langlands reciprocity correspondence for this. And it's one of the major developments of the last, I guess, 10 years. I mean, it's one of the last major developments of the last 100 years, but in particular, the last, last 10 years. But now let me talk about Shimura varieties, finally. Uh, so let me talk about an ex an, a good example of, of a semi-simple <laughs> group, GLN. Uh, uh, that was a mistake. There, I, was, I did put in, so that's, this is a mistake. Uh, I thought I corrected that, but I, it was on a different version of this talk. So what I mean is uh, GLN R modulo O n this is just o n times r star i want the i want i don't want this this r star floating around it um, and we get so h n in other words this is just, these are just uh, symmetric positive definite matrices that's another way of uh, of describing them so this is so symmetric Positive definite made ACs, N by N. And now, we, we, by exactly the same formula, we get an adelic locally symmetric space by taking first, well, this I, did, this, I didn't say that this is how you, what the formula was for GL2, but you take this and you take, the, you want to be able to take the quotient by GLN of Q, which has the advantage that it doesn't change. It's unlike gamma of n. On the other side, you take some open compact subgroups here. And for each n, you get one of these. But, and this is where things get, get uh, complicated, for n bigger than 2, this has no complex structure. And so the result is a locally symmetric space whose cohomology is 
it's very interesting, but it is not a locally symmetric algebraic variety. Uh, to the rescue comes functorial transfer, uh, which, <laughs> which I can put in a plug for Jim Marsh's new book, uh, which was mentioned in yesterday's talk. Uh, it will not cover the case I'm describing. Now, that's another book. Maybe I should mention the, the authors. I have a chance. Um, so this identifies a part of the cohomology, a part of the cohomology with the cohomology of a Delek-Shamor varieties attached to a unitary group, which is, and I said, why, why these, these are, are popular, and not GLN. And so this is how one gets Galois representations in the self-dual case, which I believe is written here, self-dual case, okay. So we take uh, maybe I think I've written this on the next slide. So the pi is isomorphic to pi dual, so pi a representation of GLN A uh, irreducible representation. So this is this 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 arrow conceals uh, a lot of a lot of uh, intermediate work. For the remaining cohomology, Galois representations can still be constructed, but the procedure is quite indirect. And if I have some time after I get to, through the next couple of slides, then maybe I can say a few words about both of these uh, missing steps. But I want to say where the, what the left shift theorem is actually doing in this this, uh, this uh, calculation. So let's suppose that G and gamma are now just finite groups. Let's calculate the trace of G acting on the cohomology of G mod gamma. Well, using the Lesch's formula. So G mod gamma is a zero dimensional topological space. And so it's Euler Poincare characteristic is just one H zero. So that one side, the trace is, is of, for the Lesch's formula is very simple. Now take, let K be an element of G and let, when is, when do we have a fixed point in G mod gamma? Well, it's, uh, we have a fixed point provided that there is an element of gamma uh, for which uh, G is, that's conjugate to, uh, to gamma, to, to K. Okay. Now I'm going to calculate the trace in a, in a, a little bit uh, strange way. So let's let this symbol mean conjugacy in gamma. And let's let, I think, ah, this was copied from another slide too. And so I'd better say, uh, so Z, G of gamma, this, this, so this is the uh, centralizer of G of gamma in any group H, which here is either G or, or gamma. So X is, is, uh, I think that this conjugacy class doesn't need to be there. Well, the fixed point set, the number of, of fixed points, is equal to the sum over the various gammas that could that you could get as conjugate to your k of uh, the number of g's that do the conjugation, and you don't count. It doesn't matter if you centralize for which this 1k, which is the characteristic function of this element k, applied to the conjugacy class is equal to 1. This is, all this is saying is that the number of g's for which, for which uh, gamma is conjugate to k. But it's a, a way of writing it that, that generalizes. And if 
I have not made a mistake in calculation, then this is equal to some volume for term, the number index, multiplied by an orbital integral. So this is, these are the orbital integrals we saw, those of us who were here yesterday saw so many times. And I've given a formula for the left shits, for the trace of uh, g acting on g mod gamma by orbital integrals. Now this is, this, and this is also, wait, I think I, this is also wrong. Sum. Yeah, sum over gamma. The sum of orbital integrals. So this is, this is maybe, this is maybe a version of the Arthur Selber trace formula. It's, not, it's an easy version. Uh, you already know that if you want to calculate the trace of uh, an element of g on g mod gamma, what you're really doing is taking, the, this is just the formula for the character of the induced representation of the trivial representation of gamma. And the uh, Arthur Selberg trace formula is, is the same thing where the, where the, the uh, subgroup is of infinite index, very infinite index in the larger group. And so the result is obviously much more complicated. But this is where orbital integrals come in, and it also comes in in, in the left formula. So if this my last slide, I think. I uh, probably just stop there. But, oh, so if you want to incorporate the action of the Galois group, you need to study the Schumer variety over finite field, as I said. And the grotendieck lefschetz trace formula gives a similar formula in terms of orbital integrals, as I uh, don't have time to describe. But that would be the topic discuss this afternoon. And the fundamental lemma is used. This is the punchline. The fundamental lemma is used twice to, to uh, compare these formulas. And once more for the functorial transfer between cohomology of the Shimura variety and the uh, locally symmetric non-permission, locally symmetric space attached to GLN. And I think I'd better stop there. Any questions? Can you just recall uh, for where, where you use it twice? Is that that's twice in the, in the geometric uh, comparison? Well, you know, when have you started using the formula? When have you stopped using the formula? This is a, this is a uh, philosophical question. But at the in very at the very least, it's used uh, to in in the in the geometry of the of the fiber of the finite field. That's one time, and also in calculating the cohomology of the Shimura variety attached to the unitary group. So, so there's the characteristic zero calculation, which is just the cohomology of the the alternating the euler poincare characteristic of the cohomology of the Shimura variety attached to the unitary group, which, you know, just to make things even more popular, UN1, this is definitely at, at, at the top of the charts these days. The, the, uh, so that's one time, and the other time is, is, for, is the grotendieck lefschetz formula for the finite, the finite field. I mean, there's one where you, where you have uh, uh, twisted orbital integrals being equal to stable. Uh, I mean, you use it when, when comparing uh, twisted orbital integrals. Um, yes, that's so. In in uh, there 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 are different schools of thought on this. So first of all, in, when you study the cohomology of of the uh, Unitary group Shimura variety, you want to you stabilize the, you get the stable trace formula for that. So that's the fundamental lemma is needed for that. And when you look at the at the formula for the counting points over uh, finite fields, you get an expression that needs to be related to uh, stable trace formula for for something. And you can do it relate it directly to GLN, uh, or you can relate it to a unitary group and various intermediate steps can be eliminated. But when, so in, in that, in that uh, calculation, just in the calculation, there's the Cotwood's version, which involves twisted orbital integrals. And then there's a version of, of my book with Richard that in, involves uh, 
twisted groups. And my contention is that these are really the same calculation, but sometimes uh, they give you slightly different information. Any other question? It was there. It, of the Galois group. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that, I meant that. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. I meant that. Mm -hmm. Well, there are several several partial explanations. First, in uh, in the the uh, in characteristic P, one knows that the Galois representations are automorphic. Well, by by induction, the induction uh, for the Galois representation is, is, is attached to uh, well, the, the the what do I want to say? I want to say that the functional equation is known for the, the analytic continuation. The functional equation is known. The the representations are uh, are known to be automorphic in that sense. I mean, there's a and so starting from a Galois representation, you can construct an automorphic representation. You need to know that all the automorphic representations arise. So that's, that was what, uh, that was what Lefort uh, proved. And the other direction, there is no a priori way of proving that the uh, L function of a, a representation of a Galois group of a number field is uh, has analytic continuation unless it's a character. So, um, so in that sense, the, the analytic properties, you could say that the analytic property problems for, for uh, number fields are, well, obviously the analytic problems for number fields are much more si serious than for function fields. I just mean that they are seemingly very different in nature. You think them much more in nature than one part of uh, the standard item vector and the other part of the item value. So you're so if you're saying that it's it would seem that it would be easier to go from eigen vectors to eigenvalues than the other way around. But in but in but in well the 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 as, as Richard explained, to go in the other direction for number fields, you you have to build on the existence of, of the, the uh, correspondence in the known direction from, from as you say, eigenvectors to eigenvalues. And then uh, essentially, if you, if you like, you could say that there's a kind of, uh, that the, the this is class, class field theory and, and, and a number of other things, uh, commutative algebra that allows you to, approx to, take, to approximate the eigenvalues in a uniform way. Can I ask you a question? Then you mentioned mm -hmm. Arthur's work. Mm -hmm. You were working with Linetri group? Ah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I can say that there is a team. Yes, I can say that there's a team that's working on the, precisely the case that, uh, I don't know whether they have a, a literary agent or a contract with a publisher, but uh, the team is, uh, some of them are here, let's see. If I can count, let's see. I think I get if I get them in alphabetical order. Of just one of them. It's here and there. Their aim is to uh, do the unitary group. But before I should also mention. Uh, There's, 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 uh, it's been divided up in a way I think I know how it's been divided up, but uh, I don't want to try to misrepresent it. So the, there is, uh, so what Arthur has done in his book is, is, has been written up uh, by Chung Pang Mok yeah. 
in the quasi split, quasi -split case, case and the other they cases. Are supposed to be doing that. Right, the cases that are related in particular to, yeah. to, to this group. Any other questions? Is it to be able to use a congruence relation? So is there a progress in trying to use it? I mean, by knowing more and get more representation? Because it's really explained why, in some sense, you build the Shimura variety to add the, the congruence relation. So, so is this a question about my, my emotional state, or is this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I know that Richard has thought a lot about using the, the congruence relation, and not even, even, uh, not even fairly recently. And uh, the congruence relation is frustrating in in other ways. It has terrible singularities, and the singularities uh, are, are, I think, very hard to understand. Much harder than anything that can be done with, uh, because the trace formula somehow is able to to is able to uh, handle the Singularities. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker for a very nice talk. Thank you.